Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rupen. I'm an internal medicine resident in Ottawa, Canada. And I wanted to start a series about helping international medical graduates or medical students who are transitioning to clerkship about the soft skills in residency, like writing a note, finding a mentor, finding a research project, um, how to maintain a healthy lifestyle during residency, um, how to be efficient on the ward. So I think one of the most important things that I struggled with in the beginning of my residency was writing a note. So a bit of background, I'm an international medical graduate. Um, I did my medical, uh, re uh, uh, my medical school abroad. Like I came from Syria and I write every North American exam, whether it's the United States last night exams or it's the Canadian uh, or what we call the MCCQE1 or the Medical Council of Canada qualifying exam or the National Assessment Collaboration objective structural clinical exam, the NAC OSCE, which is in Canada, I wrote to SMLE step 2 CS. And after writing all these exams, when I started residency, I was like shocked uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, the knowledge that we get in medical school and the knowledge that we get when we are doing exams is completely different, or let's say it's a different way of using the knowledge in residency because like, in residency, you need to practice the softer skills. You need to learn the management. You need to um, make sure you cover your basics, your important differential diagnosis. You need to really master the bread and butter. And in medical school and also in exams, they usually give you uh, one medical condition. They tell you, okay, so this is a heart failure. This is the pathophysiology. This is the epidemics. This is the, how it, you treat it. And then like you move on to pneumonia and then you move on to COPD and then you move on to acute kidney injury. But what happens in real life, patients come with all this combined. And if you're treating heart failure, you have to take into consideration that the patient has an AKI. And if you are treating an AKI, you have to take into consideration that the patient have uh, like pneumonia and this will affect the antibiotics. Uh, so uh, patients in real life are much more complex. Anyways, so my goal is to try to help uh, as many as residents as possible, as many as medical students as possible, because like, I'm passionate about teaching and I love teaching and I hope this channel will be uh, my way to spread my uh, experience. Uh, I've been on the ward for the last three years uh, and I want to help as much as medical students or international medical graduates to make their transition smoother. Uh, I'm making this channel because I wish there was someone who guided me, who told me uh, what to do uh, or how to approach different things. So one of the things I want to start talking about is the medical notes. Uh, when I started the first day of residency, I was like really shocked, like, and they asked me to go and write a progress note. And then like, I was on call at the same night. I was like, oh, go do a consult note. I was like, what's going on? Like, what should I write? And over the last two, three years, I had like lots of discussion with many people about um, what is a good medical note. The bottom line is that you can ask 10 people and you will get different 10 responses, like literally everyone have their own style. Um, every person like a note, like some people like the note to be to the point and some people like more details. And also it depends on your level of training. Like what I noticed is usually medical students write lots of details because they are told to write lots of details. And that's the medical reasoning that they have at that stage. So they have to include lots of details to make sure they don't miss any important details versus like the experienced resident, the senior resident or the staff, you will see their notes is much more shorter because like they write the only important things and they were able to utilize the information that they will gather from the patient or from the medical records. Um, and they, their medical reasoning is different. So what you learn over res like during residency is you're gonna gain gain lots of knowledge, but also the thing that you're going to learn also is the medical reasoning. Going back to the notes is the four important notes if you're doing internal medicine resident or family medicine residents or other medical residency, uh, even in surgical specialty, like the four important notes that you're going to uh, deal with most of the time are the consult note, the admission note, the progress note, and the discharge summary. Also, if you are like doing surgery, you have the operative report. If you're doing like GI fellowship, you have the operative report because like GI people do lots of scopes. Uh, so like, but in general, like you need to understand four types of notes. Um, at the end of the day, 
But uh, what is the objective? Like why we write notes? At the end of the day, we mainly write notes for two things. One, especially if you are in teaching hospital, it's to communicate, to communicate with other uh, medical uh, people, like or healthcare providers, or nurses, or physiotherapists, or occupational therapists. It's a way of communication. And also in teaching hospital, I find that medical note has lots of teaching value. Uh, you will argue that also like many people will say, oh, like we write notes to like for uh, medical legal reasons. Yes, that's right. Uh, I'm not uh, because like if things, God forbid, like go to go south and like there are some legal things intervene, but like that's not the topic of today. Uh, so, yes, you write note to make sure you document everything and you're protecting yourself and to make sure you're protecting the patient but also like in teaching hospitals or like in general during residency um, which is one of the best times in your life i will tell you why afterwards so then note is to communicate and also to show the others your thinking process and finally um, it's a teaching tool uh, so the bottom line is after asking many people and from my experience the best note is the short and sweet uh, the important details uh, without copying lots of things from other people's notes, without copying lots of labs which are already in the record, writing it short and sweet and direct to the point. Because like medicine and working in the hospital can sometimes be overwhelming. And if you're gonna like on a, con on a CTU day, like uh, if I'm doing like a medicine rotation, um, I can see usually per day like anywhere between 8 to 10 to 12 patients it depends if it's a weekend if it's a day it's a like we have residents if their residents are on vacation so it, it really varies it goes between like sometimes 2 and sometimes 12 and sometimes 15 on a weekend so you need to you, you need to read the important information especially like if you are seeing a patient you don't know the best note is the note that gives you the important information that you need to synthesize information that you will gain that day and to come up with a plan and help to transition the patients or help to make the patient better feel better um, so let's get start with the consult note so in the next uh, couple of minutes i'm gonna dissect the consult note what are the um, main paragraphs that you should mention in the consult note and what are the main points that you should mention in the consult note okay and let's get okay. started so Let's go to and dissect the consult note. All right, let's get started. So what is a consult note? We talked about it. So always when they consult you, they usually, the person who consults you, they have a question and your role is to answer that question. And if you can is provide like some teaching information for the people who are reading the note and also to explain your thinking process. So that's the main reason of a consult. And that's the main goals of the consult note. Of course, it has like, um, many, many other uh, objectives when it comes to medical legal things, but we're not going to go and dive into this. And whatever we're going to explain today is completely theoretical patient that I came up with, uh, but I will help you with that patient to show you how to organize your information when you write a consult note. Okay, so the parts of a consult note, let's say dissect one. So you have the ID. Usually you mention the patient's age, gender, are they from home, are they from nursing home? Let's say we have a patient, 76 year old male from nursing home. That's it. Uh, 85 year old female from home. Uh, reason for referral. What is the question? Uh, COPD exacerbation, diabetic wound infection, pneumonia, cough, admission for social issues. So it's a one liner that you explain why you are asked to see this patient. The past medical history we're going to talk about, the medications, the allergies, the social history, the family history the history of presenting illness, the view of system, physical exam, assessment and plan. One of the most important parts of a note is the assessment and plan. Actually, many residents, when you work in the hospital, you're gonna notice that they just scroll down when they see a note and they go to assessment and plan. And that, that makes like lots of residents or staff when they write their notes to write the assessment and the plan in the beginning of the note. Why? Because in the assessment and the plan, you take everything positive all the relative medical information and you put them in the assessment and the plan and then you write down issues issue number one we're going to do a b and c issue number two we're going to do d e and f so that is the main idea of the assessment and the plan it's one of the most important parts of the note and it's where all the positive findings 
and important negative findings that help rule out other differential diagnoses goes in. Of course, the assessment and the plan might be different because like I've heard from my friends who are doing like residency in the US that you have to write extensive differential diagnosis for insurance issues. We don't have that here in Canada. We usually are more direct and because like uh, we uh, don't have like private insurance, it's mainly uh, government based. So we write a different as a differential diagnosis, but I felt from my conversation with other colleagues in the US that they have to write more extensive differential diagnosis. Alrighty, let's go dive in. Okay, so let's take an example. This is a patient that I completely made, but the complexity of the patient it is similar to patients that you see um, in the uh, internal medicine world. Okay, so we have a, oops, sorry. We have a emergency physician asked you to see a 76 year old patient who presented uh, with, uh, sorry, who has a history of diabetes, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and COPD. And they are presenting with a two week history of cough and shortness of breath, or one week history of cough and shortness of breath. It's really, this is a patient who I completely made up. So his lab showed elevated white blood cell count, creatinine, and lactate. He was desaturating, so it was started on two liter nasal pranges uh, via, uh, the, sorry, uh, two liters of oxygen via the nasal pranges in the emergency. So that's how usually, how, that, that's what usually happens. You are like on the medicine ward or you are a part of the consult team and someone calls you and gives you the information and they ask you a question. Like I have a patient who's coming with cough and shortness of breath. I have a patient who has diabetic with infection. Can you see the patient? So they have a specific question they are asking you, right? Okay, um, so moving forward, um, the ID. We have a 76 year old patient from home. Reason for referral, cough and shortness of breath. Sweet and short. The past medical history. So now with the era of electronic medical records, uh, you can see that new electronic medical systems generates the past medical history, uh, like Epic. Um, or like other medical system, like, or uh, you, usually you can also like copy and paste, even if you are using a non-smart or like a bit old electronic medical system uh, where they, you can copy and paste the past medical history. So you have two ways of writing the past medical history, the one on the right and the one on the left. And I prefer a bit the one on the left. If you look at how the history is written. Okay, so on the right side, you have diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, COPD, atrial fibrillation. And that's it. So you really cannot understand the severity of the illnesses that the patient has, okay? So look at the left. We have heart failure. It is ischemic cardiomyopathy. The, it is hef ref. That means it's a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the patient had, last echo was done in June, 2021. And his ejection fraction is 38%. No exacerbations in the last year. So I understand the severity of their heart failure and what type of heart failure do they have. The CKD, it's an ischemic CKD. It is followed by nephrology and his baseline creatinine is 175. So now I have a better understanding of their baseline chronic kidney disease. Atrial fibrillation, is it persistent or is it paroxysmal? Here, I have an understanding that it's a persistent. The CHAZ score, in the coming videos, like I will create videos in the future about what are the important scores that you need to know while you are on the internal medicine ward. So here, one of the most important score is the CHADS2 score. This, will, this score will give you an idea about the risk of stroke in the future. So here uh, we have a CHADS score of four. He's on rate control with beta blockers and anticoagulation with apixaban. Okay, so medically, some might argue that that Pixaban here could be wrong because the patient has CKD, but again, this is a theoretical patient. I'm just making up information. I'm trying to show you how to write a good note. Um, so diabetes, he's on metformin and he's on empagliflozin and his last HbA1c was 6.3. So now you can understand, okay, so at one point he has a good control diabetes. He has really, um, uh, uh, like he has an atrial fibrillation, which might predispose him to high risk of stroke. He has advanced heart failure. Uh, he has like mildish uh, CKD that is based on his GFR. He has COPDs on triple therapy, Lama Lava ICS, 
his last exacerbation was on X state. So why it's important when we talk about chronic conditions to talk about their last exacerbation? Because a patient with COPD with no exacerbation in the last year is completely different from a patient with COPD with two exacerbation or three exacerbation the last year. A patient with heart failure with no exacerbation the last year, it's completely different from a patient who had four admission for heart failure exacerbation. One of them is you're gonna optimize their medical treatment. You're gonna find out why the patient had an exacerbation. And the other with four exacerbation, the last year you're gonna think, oh, like this is a patient with advanced heart failure. When should we consider palliating treatment, palliative treatments? So the, the treatment and the approach is completely different when you have um, no exacerbations versus you have several exacerbations, uh, when you can find the cause of the exacerbation versus you cannot find the cause. Again, if you are busy, you might not find the time to dig into the chart and write details. But when it comes to the past medical history or mentioning medical conditions, uh, my advice is like important a score that is related to that medical condition and the severity of that medical condition. If I read the past medical history on the left side, I will have a better idea about the severity of the diseases versus on the right side. Let's say, for an example, if the patient have cirrhosis, their MELDA score is going to be important. What child Q is, are there child QA, child QB, child QC? Those are important things to take into consideration, which I'm going to talk about in future videos where I'm talk about where I'm going to talk about like uh, cirrhosis. Okay, so now this how to write the past medical history. Uh, one of the last steps is electronic medical records auto-populate past medical history and they create a note where they can pull up the past medical history. Make sure it's accurate. Sometimes because like it might uh, reflect things like wear dentures or wear glasses or other things that really um, does not fit nicely into the past medical history. Uh, or it could be like uh, put there by error. Uh, one of the things like one of the times I remember, I had a patient, uh, the past medical history mentioned that he has diabetes, but I've used his medications and there were like no medication for diabetes. So I went to talk to the family and the patient did not have diabetes. I said, okay, I'm just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna throw an HPA1C and the patient's HPA1C was five. So make sure you have an accurate past medical history. And last, I wanted to see, I want you to look at the osteoarthritis. Just take a look, we're gonna talk about osteoarthritis when we talk about the uh, assessment and plan. All righty. Medications, again, in real life, it's different when compared to the CS exam or the, the CS exam is in the US, the NAC OSCE exam is in Canada, I took both. So you just ask the patient what medications, one or two medications in real life, usually it's five to 10 and mention the source, especially if you are on call overnight. Uh, one of the things that usually happen that lots of medical errors happen when we admit patients from the community to the hospital and then we discharge them from the hospital to the community. Uh, medication reconciliation, it's a big issue and lots of medication can change, doses can change and this can affect the patient care. If a patient has a heart failure and they came with diuretics and they were on Lasix 40 and you discharge them with a Lasix 20, they are more likely to come again with heart failure exacerbation. So make sure that you address those medications and you write down what is the source, like those medications for me in my, this theoretical patient, they were updated from the daughter. If you updated them from electronic medical record or you call the pharmacy, make sure to mention that in the patient medication list. Or sorry, when you write down the medications or let's say the patient had a blister pack, write that down. Uh, okay, so moving on, allergies. Allergies, again, one of the issues with electronic medical records, they can auto-populate allergies. Um, from my experience, it's always important to ask not only what are the allergies, uh, how the patient reacts to them. Um, one of the common two allergies that I usually uh, encounter are like penicillin allergy and aspirin allergy. Lots of patients think that, oh, we are allergic to penicillin. And when do you go to ask a patient what happened? Oh, like I, I can't remember, like when I was a child, uh, someone told me I'm allergic to penicillin. Um, and then you challenge them with penicillin, nothing happened. Like lots of, there are studies there that say like lots of people who say that they are allergic, but in reality they are not. So it's not only the allergies, but how or what did they develop when they had allergies in the past? Or what do they mean by allergies? If a patient tells me that 10 years ago they got penicillin 
and they became hypotensive and tachycardic and they could not breathe or they had swallowing swelling in their tongue this is completely different from a patient who cannot remember why they are told that they are allergic to penicillin the same for aspirin especially if you are doing cardiology like some patients who come to the hospital they say you are allergic to aspirin and if they are presenting with non STEMI or STEMI and you need to give them like aspirin and now like they're allergic to aspirin like what do you mean by allergy to aspirin um, some things also happen in the hospital like let's say a patient developed a GI bleed in the past and they were on uh, like ibuprofen or like any other medication like that uh, belongs to the NSAIDs and someone put aspirin or NSAIDs under the allergy uh, under the allergies so now this patient cannot take allergies cannot take NSAIDs or aspirin because like it's there um, for some reason they were using it in the past they developed GI bleed so this situation is a bit more complex you should talk to your staff you should ask the patient what do they mean by allergy it's not only the writing down allergies what symptoms do patients develop when they get these medications okay moving on the social history again when you're doing your cs exam or your NAC oski exam um so you just go and ask about smoking alcohol and drugs but in reality like there are many other things that we usually care about uh, we really care about their patient's functional status and living situation why because when you admit patients to the hospital and they stay in the hospital for one week they will deteriorate and this usually happens with elderly people uh, they lose their functional capacity a patient might get admitted to the hospital and on admission the family will tell you oh like our dad or our patient uh, usually use a cane and then when you're in discharge you notice that they have uh, lots of weakness in their legs and that's something that you're going to notice on the internal medicine ward that you need the help of your colleague occupational therapy and physiotherapy so the functional status is also important to ask patient about their adls iadls dressing eating ambulating toileting shopping housekeeping um i usually use the mnemonic death shaft uh, about uh, the important things you can search google about death shaft mnemonic it helps to uh, memorize the idls and iadls and iadls and very important very important very important because if you're going to discharge a patient who deteriorated in the hospital you have to link them with uh, social help uh, through the social worker or you have to link them with an occupational therapist it depends on the hospital it depends on where are you practicing it depends on the available resources in your community so when you're admitting a patient and make sure to ask about their adls and ideals and who they live with a patient who lives by himself or herself is completely different from a patient who lives by, with family and they have support and they have people to help them to guide them so also uh, ask about who lives with them if you want to be more specific you can ask do they have any stairs at their home because like a patient who cannot use a stair and if they're going to use the stairs to go to the bathroom it's a different from a patient who lives in a bungalow and everything is available on the same floor because when patients who are elderly and they need to use the stairs and for going up or going down to the washroom they are more likely to fold and uh, when you also are on the internal medicine ward you're going to notice that um, many patients who are admitted for a fall reason or they had fall when you ask them about their home environment you're going to notice that they have to go up the stairs or down the stairs because like it's one of the environmental issues or hazards that predispose the patient to high risk of fall especially elderly people who have Parkinson's disease or other issues that affect their uh, equilibrium living situation who lives with the patient and we talk about this so make sure it's not only smoking alcohol drugs like you learn in the cs exam or the nac oski exam there is also the functional status and also the living situation who lives with them how functional are they and how safe their environment is is their environment okay so is there a presenting illness okay so now History of presenting illness is just like you used to write down if you're if you did the CS exam uh, in the past or if you did the OSCE exam uh, in, in the OSCE exam you don't write down the history of present illness but my advice is I want you to compare the first paragraph to the second paragraph the first paragraph throws information about the history of present illness without taking into consideration the timeline the second paragraph takes into the consideration the timeline what do I mean by that? Like, if you read the first one, 
So the history obtained from the daughter, it's important to mention where do you get your history from? If the patient was confused, mention that. Okay, so she reported that Mr. X developed cough and shortness of breath for the last five days. Moving forward, this was preceded by a runny nose and sore throat one week ago. So we went back. And now we are talking about for the last week, she also reported the patient's appetite decreased and he was experiencing some rigors. It's all over the place. We have symptoms that are going on for the last week. We have symptoms that are going on for the five days. We have symptoms that have been going on for the last week again. And the, you, you can't like really differentiate between what are the symptoms and what are the things that you found on review of systems. The second paragraph, history obtained from the doctor, but here she reports that the father had a runny nose and some sore throat a week ago, followed by a cough and shortness of breath for the last five days or five days ago. Uh, five days ago, the family noticed that the patient has been delirious for the last two days. So I'm going from the past. I'm telling the story moving forward, and this makes much more sense. If someone's going to tell you a story, uh, usually there are like different types of stories, but like usually the easiest part, if I go back to what happened in 1950, then what happened in 1960, and then what happened in 1970, it will make it easier for the reader to digest the information. And it will also make it easier to the reader to, okay, so those are the things that the patient reported on the symptoms. And those are the things on the review of system that we obtained as when we went forward, uh, when, sorry, when we went to, when we try to uh, go deeper and ask about like other symptoms. So go in timely manner, start from the past and go forward until the present. Okay. One of the things that usually you will see in internal medicine ward or like any other ward, patients are complex. Patients are really complex. They have like many medical issues and they might have multiple hospitalizations. Like a patient might present with let's say pericarditis and they had a STEMI one month ago. So those could be related. Uh, or a patient presents with abdominal pain and they had uh, pancreatitis one month ago on a different admission. So you're gonna see that there is a lot of complex um, things that might come together. And this is very common in internal medicine ward or any other medical, even surgical wards, are, you, patients are complex. So what I found to be helpful is to create different paragraphs for different months or different admissions. And then bullet points, write down what happened during the admission or what were the diagnosis and what were the recommendation time of discharge. And then what is going on now? How did the patient present? Especially if the two events are related. Uh, sometimes the history of present illness might cover things that happened over a six month. So you need to make it short, brief, nice, go from the past until the present and put them in paragraphs divide them either like from here, I divided them like what happened in August, what happened in December. You can divide them to what happened in the first admission, what happened in the second admission, what happened in the third admission and so forth. So organize your history of present illness because sometimes those can be really, really, really long. Okay, uh, the course in the ED. This is one of the paragraphs that I noticed that medical students and residents add on their notes and I really find it helpful. So especially if you're doing internal medicine or like page, if you're admitting service, patient come to the emergency department, they have cough and shortness of breath. And let's say they stay there for five or six hours and the emergency physician is trying to treat them. Um, so they give them like antibiotics, they give them some fluids and then the patient deteriorates and he started on, he was started on nasal pranges, uh, two liters of oxygen via nasal pranges. So mentioning what happened in the ED, because sometimes patients can stay in the ED for a long time, especially in Canada, like sometimes patient might spend like 10 hours in the ED because the patient, the physician is not sure whether that the patient will get better or whether they can be, uh, or the patient can be discharged. So adding a small paragraph about the patient had antibiotics in the ED, the patient got fluids in the ED, the patient was starting on oxygen or he had a CT scan which showed um, A, B, C finding. Those are, those things are important and will help you separate the history of present illness from the course in the ED and what happened in the ED. Okay, what did you find on physical exam? Um, I think you, the OSCE exam and the step two, uh, step two CS uh, helps you a lot in this. Uh, it's straightforward. Whatever you, whatever you find on physical exam, make sure to document the findings. If you find the murmur, the grade of the murmur, radiation of the murmur, if you're looking at the JVP, how high the JVP was above the sternal anger, 
angle uh, and make sure you examine the JVP at 45 degrees. If you find edema, how high does it go? If you find the crackles, where are they anatomically? The patient is oriented to time, person, place. Write down that, write that down in between paragraphs. Like the patient is oriented to time, person, but not place, or time, but not place and person. Mention the details. Uh, because like if you tell me the patient is oriented times three versus the patient oriented times two, and what are the things that oriented to, uh, the second day when I come and see the patient, this will help me to know, oh, so yesterday, this was his baseline, and today he improved. Like yesterday he was oriented times two, only time and person, uh, but today he's oriented times three. So whatever we are doing, it's working, right? So um, add details and only things that you find on a physical exam. Um, don't add things like usually what I see sometimes like, uh, people might add something from the uh, review of system there or like it's representing illness there like make sure to add only things that are related to your physical exam okay and moving forward investigations again the new electronic medical records usually auto populate uh, I love to dictate my investigations the labs it depends how busy I am again on the word if I'm really busy I would just like auto populate or copy paste from the labs to my notes or I would just dictate the important positive. Like, let's say the patient had 20 investigation, but all I need is elevated white blood cell count, elevated lactate, and elevated creatine from the baseline. So I just mentioned this, and it will make it much more easier for the reader because like now the note is shorter, um, and now the note is more uh, condensed and scrolling down through the note, especially if you're using, uh, if the hospital is using an electronic medical record, makes it much more easier. Again, you either copy paste, or you let the electronic medical system to auto-populate, or you only dictate the important positive things, and you say the other labs were reviewed and there are no other significant findings. Okay, imaging and investigation. Again, you can go into details, like you can look at the ECG and you can read the ECG. Um, one of the things that early trainees or medical students do is, okay, so they, the new ECG machines can read the ECG. So the ECG machines say, okay, so normal science written, they just write that down. Um, or they, like, let's say the patient has a pacemaker and they have a pacemaker and the machine cannot detect that. They, the machine might say like, there is a left bond of branch block or right bond of branch block. And they, they would just like write that down. Try to read it, try to read the ECG and try to interpret the ECG in your own words. Um, the, uh, for the chest X-ray, write down, the, for sorry, for the imaging, write down the important findings, the positive things, uh, what are, or if you're gonna copy paste the result of a CT scan or copy paste the result of MRI, those can be really long paragraphs. Make sure to highlight the positive findings because if you read the report of a CT scan, the reader, the, uh, the radiology resident will comment on the, like on the spleen, on the liver, on the small bowels, on the large bowels, uh, on the intestine, on the pelvic organs, on the ovaries, on the prostate, um, but if you highlight the important findings of the CT scan or you only write down the conclusion if that paragraph is available, it makes it much more easier. So either write down the positive or if you're going to mention the entire report, make sure to highlight the important things in that report. Okay, moving forward, the assessment and the plan, if this is the most important part of your notes, um, you're going to mention the important things. Remember that our patient had osteoarthritis, right? So if you read my assessment so this is a six year old patient who have a past medical history with hef ref heart failure with reduced ejection fraction the severity of the hef ref is 30 his ejection fraction was 37 this is a he has a copd his fep1 let's say 50 percent he has a ckd his gfr is x he has atrial fibrillation chad's score is four let's say he has diabetes last hba1c i did not mention osteoarthritis why because i'm not going to address osteoarthritis while the patient is in the hospital on unless the patient is presenting with knee joint pain or like some joint pain that is concerning either for osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, a flare or septic arthritis. So if it is not important, it's not a hospital issue, usually try to avoid it. Again, some people might disagree with me. Uh, some people like the details, some people not. Um, this is what I found helpful from asking many, many people around me and also like from searching the webs on what makes a note good note. So I mentioned the patient past medical history. Now the reader who is reading this understand that this is a really sick, complex patient. He has multiple medical issues and it looks like his COPD is like moderate to severe. His FEV1 is 50% he's also have like 
some uh, degree of advanced heart failure, resurrection fraction is 37. Okay, and he also has an uh, AFib, he has a high CHAD score. Uh, now the reader understand, okay, so I have a pretty sick patient. And in the assessment, I say the patient's presenting with COPD exacerbation or AKI. For sure, I know that this is a COPD exacerbation. Um, or I might mention the patient presenting with shortness of breath and cough, and the following paragraph summarizes the differential diagnosis. So I'm only mentioning the pertinent, the important positive findings in the past medical history. And, and then I'm saying, what is my assessment? What I think is going on with this patient? And now we're gonna move on. So we told the reader that this is our assessment. This is how sick a patient is. And this is what we think is going on in one or two liners. And then we're gonna mention the issues. So if the patient is presenting with shortness of breath and cough, and you're not sure it's pneumonia or COPD, so you can write shortness of breath and cough. Or if the patient is presenting with shortness of breath and cough, and you know for sure it's COPD exacerbation, so you can write down COPD exacerbation. So we're gonna divide things to issues. We have the shortness of breath and cough, or we have the COPD exacerbation. We have the heart failure. Let's say you are not sure. And this happens a lot on the internal medicine ward. Um, like you have a patient, who's presenting with shortness of breath and cough, and you are not sure, is it a heart failure exacerbation or is it a COPD exacerbation? Because the patient has some cough and increase of phlegm and like some purulence uh, sputum, purulence sputum. And also on the other hand, they have worsening edema or increasing weight. So it could be both. It could be a COPD exacerbation, which caused a heart failure exacerbation. So it could be both. And you have to address those two issues or three issues. So you have to write them down in different paragraphs. And then you have to write the assessment for the COPD exacerbation. How severe is it? Does he meet the entire, like, uh, does he have increase of phlegm and increased cough, shortness of breath and increased purulent? Uh, if it is pneumonia, is it in the right lower lobe? Is it in the left lower lobe? Is it bilateral? Um, the, the status, how bad it is? Uh, the patient is on two liters of, of oxygen. Um, the physiology, so this is, if, if you're gonna mention um, issues, and you want to mention a specific assessment under each issues, those are the things we usually comment and uh, uh, comment on uh, when you are mentioning specific issues. And then your plan. What I find helpful is instead of mentioning the plan as bullet points, is mentioning them as one, two, or three. The reader will usually have an easier time reading uh, when it is, okay, so we have four recommendations for issue number one, we have three recommendations for issue number two, and we have one recommendation for issue number three. Um, so again, the assessment and plan, it's important things, important positives, what we think is going on, a paragraph for the assessment, and then the plan is going to be a bit issue-based. What are we thinking about issue number one? What is our differential diagnosis? And what is our plan? What are we thinking about issue number two? What is differential diagnosis? What is our assessment? What is the severity of the case? What is our plan in bullet points? Sweet and short. Hey guys, if you liked the video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you have like any issues or anything do you want me, you, you want me to address uh, in the future in my videos, uh, please let me know in the comments. And you can follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, and yeah, I will see you in the next video. Have a great day.